Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Software. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 197 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in St. Louis. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. In our last episode, we talked about failed technology projects and initiatives and the notion of pivoting. I've just returned from viewing the total eclipse of the sun in Missouri, and that's given me some new perspective and a a new math equation for people. And that is totality equals awesome. I I can't wait (laughs) till 2024 um, and when I'll be chasing totality again. So it's, uh, it's... the end of August and people are going back to school. So we thought it uh, might be a good time to take a look at uh, legal education and what law students are are taught now and maybe what they should be taught about legal technology. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, uh, we're going to indeed be digging into the inclusion of legal technology uh, into law school curriculum, uh, a topic that's been going on for a while now. In our second segment, we've got another question from one of our listeners. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots. That one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. Uh, But first, uh, legal tech in legal education. Like I said, this topic is certainly not new. We've been talking about teaching law students about technology and specifically legal technology for, I think, quite a long time. Uh, When I was preparing for this, I had to remind myself that... uh, Seven years ago, uh, I at one of the I maybe was the very first Ignite Law competitions. I gave a very fast talking speech, uh, and my topic then was was called "No Lawyer Left Behind: A Realistic Approach to Practice Management Education." That included teaching law students about technology in law school and why um, why it wasn't working right now and how to fix it. While I think a lot more law schools since that time have uh, started to incorporate technology uh, with their curriculum, I think both of us are going to agree here that it's not happening as fast or as broadly uh, as it probably should be. Dennis, what do you think has reopened the question about whether technology should be part of the law school experience? You know, Tom, you were just reminding me of your, uh, I was just thinking of your Ignite Law speech, because I think that might have given me the idea to listen to podcasts at double speed, Uh, (laughs) because you certainly took one approach to getting everything done in six minutes. And you still got all the information. Right. Well, I I think what's happening is back to school time. And so people are thinking about uh, uh, legal education. And so you see, I've seen more discussion of it, but I think it comes down to a couple things. One, the law school admissions numbers are down by shocking percentages. And you see some schools with the actual attendance numbers significantly down. The law firms out there do not feel that students are what they call practice ready, especially on technology. Although you could also say that some of the lawyers and firms are not practice ready on technology either. And then I think that the ethical requirement of technology competence also is playing a, a role in that. Um, and so those are the things. And, I, and in some way tweeted today, I thought was interesting. They said you could tell when school started because there would be the posts from professors banning laptops from the classroom. So I think there's been sort of a traditional law school hostility to including tech in in the curriculum, with some notable exceptions. Uh, You know, Michigan State and and other schools uh, come to mind on that. So I think it's those things have kind of brought it to the forefront. And I know, Tom, we kind of look at this, this topic from time to time, but it sort of feels like people are really starting to question how law is taught and what it does mean. And that notion of practice ready, I think, has become more important as people think, how do they need to innovate in the law school curriculum? 
Well, I agree. And, and, you know, bringing up the fact that law school attendance numbers are down sort of brings up a, a, a side issue that is also technology related, but maybe not so much to the topic of this episode, which is that uh, that people who are interested in the law uh, may need to find themselves going into fields like e-discovery or legal technology as a practice or as, as a career. Uh, obviously, that's probably a subject of another episode. In fact, we probably did talk about that in an episode in the past. Um, but what I think is interesting about being the, the notion of being practice ready is that today's law students know more about tech, arguably know more about technology than any class before them. And, and, and you know, to use a term that gets used, it's pretty much overused these days, um, they're digital natives, not uh, digital, I guess, immigrants like those of us who came into the law as that technology was maturing. But what's interesting, again, is that as much as current generations know about technology, I would argue that a lot of them still aren't competent in those practice-ready tech skills, you know, that Casey Flaherty talked about in his tech audit and that, that he measures in that. It's the skills that lawyers need to be able to just to do the average job that they do. Um, and I would say that uh, no matter when you, no matter your comfort level with technology, um, I still think that that's a component that's missing from a lot of law school curriculum across the country. Yeah, and, and so I, I know that I talk to a lot of people who say, well, these digital natives, you think they know technology, but when it comes to like, you know, doing track changes in Word or doing, you know, some of these things, they, they can't do that at all. They're they're overrated in a way. And I think there is a big difference to me of being I, I think you use the word comfortable with technology, right. which I do think the the so-called digital natives are. And so th that to me makes their perspective really interesting. And I think within that comfort, then learning the skills is a lot easier than, say, for the lawyers who are anti-technology or un you know truly uncomfortable with it. And then I also think that the digital natives are, are – you know, also comfortable with changes in technology and some different things. So right now, I think there's questions uh, with technologies. I was just writing something the other day saying, you know, what is, we're so document focused now. Well, what happens as we do voice interfaces and other things like that? And the document does not become the center of what it is that we're looking at, that we're looking at uh, other things, other types of data. And so are some of the technology skills that we think are important now, the sort of Microsoft Office skills, those sorts of things, will they, they be as important? So, so I, I think it's good to distinguish between the tech skills piece, which I think um, there is a role in, in legal education, because uh, you can focus that, and I, I have a few thoughts on that. And the actual integration of, of technology into the way courses are taught, into the types of assignments that you do, into the sort of more clinical and practical approaches. And that, to me, is the really interesting piece, is, is how can we make the class is more relevant, more practical, and bring the technology right into that rather than to say, oh, we're just going to do basic tech training. I think it's it's a combination, and I I agree with you. And I want to actually, I'm gonna I'm I'm saving I'm gonna hold back on integrating tech into courses and into curriculum a little bit later when we talk kind of about how we would approach this. I still personally think that the tech skills are going to be more valuable in the long run, um, but I really think law students need to be exposed to both. Where I'm going to draw my line for this session and maybe we for this episode, maybe we don't need to talk about it after this, is that there are a lot of schools that are doing interesting things about technology um, that are, you know, really great, amazing curriculum, but, um, and, and I'll, I'll call out, you know, Michigan State as an example here, is that uh, it's it's a great selection of courses, but it definitely does not fall into that tech skill set of things. There, there are courses that would have some practical utility to litigators, um, like e-discovery. There's an information privacy and security, very topical. It's the hot practice area, so definitely makes sense to have that. But there's also things on artificial intelligence or quantitative analysis or entrepreneurial lawyering, which are, I think, all 
extremely useful if you plan to go into a practice of law that deals with these particular topics, but it doesn't really further your technical skills to do the day-to-day stuff. It really isn't. It's, it's, it's giving you some useful information on a specific thing that might be able to help you if you go into that particular area of law, but um, you know, it's not going to help you attract changes or learning styles in Word. And I know that's being too simplistic about it, um, but um, that's kind of where I want to draw the line is, is that I think that those kinds of classes are valuable in their own right, um, but I tend to put a little bit more value in terms of competence, in terms terms of, you know, what's what is the <laughs> what's the job to be done, as you like to say, of teaching technology in schools is I would rather it be for tech skills um, than for kind of learning about the hot new technology. I think they're both important. I'm just kind of weighting the tech skills more at this point. Yeah, so let me do one of my favorite things when I think about a topic, which is kind of turn everything on its head. And so when I look at Michigan State, I look at Georgetown with their their app competitions, other schools out there um, that are doing some really cool things. And I just, you start to say, well, um, and, and you listed the, some of those classes, and I go, you know what? I mean, what's happening in law is going to change. There is something called law tech, one word, that people are talking about. There's a lot of startup money going into law tech. So job to be done notion is law school turn out traditional lawyers or is it to uh, provide a way to bring people into the delivery of services of legal services in both traditional and and new ways why is it not both i think it could be both but i don't think other than the few examples that we have it's it's you see both right now so i i think as people start to rethink the law school curriculum they say do we need to have certain specific practice focuses, you know, international, intellectual property, those sorts of things. Do we need to have people, because right now, I, I think if I were in law school, it would be really tempting if there was a, you know, a, a, I know we don't do majors in law school, but if you had something that was focused on e-discovery and, and then included the technology behind it, I think it'd be, that would be really attractive to me. And, so, and there are also some of these other things I could say, well, if I don't want to go in, a, in the traditional lawyer role, can, how can I use uh, you know, the law school education to go in these different, you know, di- different areas that are, are really starting to open up in the last year or so. So like I said, that's kind of looking in a completely different way, but to say not only is the approach that we take, which tends to not include technology use, which tends to de-emphasize practical skills and focus on the theoretical, is that something that we're going to have to grow beyond. I mean, that is a big question law schools have. And the other thing is, and this goes to the numbers, is like, is it going to become a vehicle for people to enter into what I'll call law tech, for lack of a better term? Well, I think that everything you said is absolutely right. I don't think that it's necessarily turning anything on its head. I think that today, more than ever in the past, technology and the law, I hate to say the, these words, intersect more often, but there's more applications and new applications of technology to the law than ever before. It's getting overwhelming, the amount of things. I, you know, we've been, we've been planning this next year's ABA Tech Show, and you know, I want to expand it to a four or five or six day conference because there's so many interesting technology topics that now have to do with the law that it, it's impossible to include them in just a short conference. And I would argue argue it's the same with law school. And so that's why I kind of keep coming back to say all that stuff is great. Taking a, you know, if you could major in e-discovery in law school, that's great. I'll still come back and say that if you can't format a Word document that you use to create your e-discovery report in, um, then you're lost at that point. So that's why I keep coming back to the basic skills as being really the key topic that some lawyers need to understand, I think most lawyers need to understand, regardless of what the future of law looks like, whether some jobs are going to get replaced by lawyers, I would argue in answer to your first question that yes, many lawyers are still going to be doing the same types of work that they've been doing for the past 50 years 
for the next 50 years, it's, it's going to look different, but I would argue that the technical skills will not be considerably different in 50 years. Uh, well, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm going to walk that one back a little bit and say that I think that, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I think, I, I think that lawyers will need basic technical skills on a computer for the foreseeable future. Let's just say that's my prediction and that I still think that's got to be a priority in law school. Well, I mean, and I think it, you know, in in fifty years' time, of course, the AIs are going to be I know. hiring their own lawyers. I shouldn't have used fifty years. And, I and those used lawyers like need to be years, right? aware okay. of of AI. So yeah, 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 yeah. So I think what you see more of is the notion of uh, practical skills classes, uh, a little bit of law practice management classes, maybe one offer to people, more emphasis on, on clinical. You see legal software companies, not just Westlaw and Lexus, offering tools to, to students, but other other legal tech companies as, as well, especially in part of the, the clinical program. So you see some things starting to happen. And I know I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I I was an adjunct for for, for a couple of years recently at, at Washington University Law School, and I did a class in uh, intellectual property licensing and, and drafting. And so there were eight written assignments of that were drafting different types of of IP documents. But what I tried to do from the beginning of that class was to say, okay. Here's how how a lawyer might use technology. You know, going from the basic. Okay, you've been given this assignment. What is it that you do? You know, do you write it longhand? Do you go to a computer? And, and just to get people s- starting to think that way. And then the assignment started to say, you need to sh- do track changes. You need to do PowerPoint slides, which gave me a way to kind of talk through my approach to to using PowerPoint for students. So I, I think that you can, to me, I couldn't really figure out a way to do a drafting class that where I just ignored the fact that there was technology that you would have to use. So I, I think in... Um, and and I have I mean not to not to blow my own horn, but it's the the students have told me that 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 class was incredibly helpful to them when they started working. They thought it was, you know, they they knew how to do things. They were, you know, they had the concept of doing drafts. They had to, they knew how to do track changes, those sorts of things. And they thought it really gave them a, a good start to their career. And I think that um, those are the things that students want. And when you're paying the huge amount um, that you pay to go to law school, and trying to get a job that covers your loans, I think that it's not just the firms that want to feel their practice ready. I think the students want to do that as well. And so I think there are ways to incorporate um, technology, but I think if it's just a stray class here or there, I'm not sure how totally effective that is. And I also have the sense that it's more the adjuncts um, who bring that in at the moment, and that the, your sort of traditional law school classes ten, are still fairly abstract and, and theoretical these days, and get you to, you know, the the classic think like a lawyer, um, and that's that's what I think is the law schools are starting to question. Well, and I think that's I mean that was one of the premises of my of my speech seven years ago, it, which is that the faculty in most law schools, at least at that time, and I think as you say, t- even today, tend to be more academic and that value add in a te- from a technology or even from really any practice management standpoint um, was brought in by adjunct and practicing lawyers who are coming in. And, and that's why I want to talk really about uh, an example here in Dallas that, that I think is a good example of, of how to get started and how to think about it. So maybe let's pivot here. You've talked about how you, how you taught your one class as an adjunct. Maybe now let's... Um, Let's talk about how we'd each include technology in our own, you know, if we could design curricula uh, the, the way that we wanted to, how we would do it. And I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. I think unsurprisingly, I would start by having some type of practical skills clinic, um, a one semester clinic at some point during law school education that is teaching Word, Excel, PowerPoint, 
Adobe Acrobat. I think, frankly, it's going to cover a lot more than that. It's going to be time and billing, document assembly, practice management tools, um, even just introducing those tools early on, even if they aren't getting nuts and bolts training, I think is still a valuable exercise. But, uh, you know, one of the great examples I, I've noticed over the past couple of years is the University of North Texas College of Law um, recently got uh, its ABA accreditation. So, yep, it's it's a, a relatively new law school here in Dallas. I met with them early on. Um, fortunately, haven't been involved with them since then, but I met with them early on, and they are have been, were and still are talking about making their curriculum truly experiential. So um, they wanted to give everyone uh, a subscription to a practice management tool from day one. You walk into the law school on your first day, you have a subscription to um, a tool like Rocket Matter or like Clio, and they would be using it every day to enter time that they would spend studying for class or working for class or studying for exams, which is a great way to start using those time and billing software. But, but you know, what if they could build, like you mentioned, in- integrate technology into every class. And and I don't know that they ever got around to doing this, but they have lots of great uh, adjuncts who are teaching things. And I just, I mean, I think that it's kind of a no-brainer to do things like in contracts, you could learn about document assembly or about contracts management software. It's a natural part of the contracting process. In torts, um, you could learn more about artificial intelligence and big data and how that's making litigation prediction a huge business these days and how litigators are actually getting smarter about the cases that they're trying because of this technology. What about trial advocacy if you could spend some time actually learning how to use the iPad in court or learning about how to use some of these other tools so you leave school with some practical knowledge on how to try a case um, by yourself using technology. Um, you know, frankly, for all I know, and, and, and I, this is why part of me feels like a fraud in debating this issue with you on this podcast, is I don't know if some schools may be doing these things. I think they ought to, to a certain extent, ought to be tried uh, by more schools where, you know, wherever there's a technical component, it ought to be mentioned, it ought to be explored. I think it ought to be taught. So, Dennis, how would, how would your approach to technology in schools differ from mine? Well, there's going to be overlap, of, of course. I, but I, th- I think you, that there needs to be more focus on what lawyers actually do I think that we need to look at the way technology is is changing so many things, and and then I think there is uh, so that's one thing. Like the examples you gave are great. I mean, I think it's really hard these days, in any number of areas, not to have like a basic grounding in statistics and some of the, you know the predictive analytics and stuff. I think would be huge benefits if I were in the litigation field, you know, and it, and it. it it seems difficult for me to say I'm going to go through and just think about this in this sort of abstract, you know, theoretical way, because um, I don't know how much that that helps you. So I think there are some ways to incorporate, and and I think that probably my most controversial thing would be to say I just think this notion of the old law school approach of you go to lectures the whole semester and you have one final that everything is based on. And then your grades depend on, you know, how that gets graded versus saying, can you do something where there are a number of assignments? And some of them, you know, are the theory stuff. And some of it is more, you know, practical in some ways. And some of it is technology related. Um, Because I think that in grade schools these days, you know, kids are putting together videos. They're doing PowerPoint slides. They're doing these interactive things that... uh, I, you know, in law school, I think there it tends to be more lecture. So I, I think you're right, Tom. I, I don't want to be like overly critical because I know there's a lot of cool stuff going on. And I think the legal writing, you know, classes, people are doing some really interesting things a, as well. Um, but I, I don't think it gets the priority that it should. So I sort of feel like you, Tom, there's this required, you know, legal research and writing. I would open up some time for the practical technology that you need to learn to do that, you know, run that at the same time. Um, and then I would start to say, how can I integrate technology to, to start to move away from the notion of, you know, the all or nothing ex- final exam and then to kind of more align with the way technology is actually used in the practice these days. 
then just more electives that allow you to go deeper into these things. So like the Michigan State curriculum you were talking about, to me, that's kind of cool because I think you can kind of really go deeply into areas and then, you know, possibly do independent study as well. All those things to me are great. And I, I think it's partly that if I'm a student paying you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, I want to have an education that's going to help me get moving into the career. So I think there will be some lobbying from students. I think that uh, professors can look into what's going on out there. It seems like there's a very active community of professors who are trying a lot of things. And then I think the schools have to take on the job of really reflecting on what it is they're doing and how they need to meet the needs of everybody, including the community, in what it is that they do and involve, you know, people who are just going to look at things in different ways or to say, hey, we do need this component and we do need more clinical, we do need more practical, we need do need more technology and and to value that and that's very uh disruptive the the word people like to use these days and i use it in a way that it's shaking things up not in the classic disruption notion so those are the things i see tom well that's sort of uh, you've, you've sort of i think uh I was about to close this out with let's maybe offer up some practical suggestions for law students or professors or law schools on this whole sort of thing. And I don't know that you've, well, I don't know whether you've covered it all right there or not, but I'm, I'm going to end with mine. And then Dennis, if you have anything you want to wrap up with, I'm going to give kind of one big practical suggestion and it's, it's a self-interested suggestion, which is attend ABA tech show. Um, you know, if you feel like you're not getting uh, the technology education in law school that you want, uh, ABA tech show is a great opportunity and not just because you learn about technology and the real reason why I mention this is that uh, again Tech Show 2018 is hosting an academic track which I think is going to offer some interesting sessions last year they spent a lot of time talking about how to introduce technology curricula into law schools. And I think they're going to be talking about that again. So if you are a professor, if you are a student, if you are affiliated with a law school and you want to see that uh, law school um, use more uh, and talk more about technology um, with its law students, then uh, come to Tech Show, join the conversation, learn a lot more. And on top of that, you can go out uh, and go to other parts of this of the, the conference where you can get your practical skills, where you can learn about a whole lot of new topics that you may may not have had any exposure to. Um, and if you're a law student, it's really a price you can't beat. It's only 100 bucks for a three-day conference, which is really kind of an amazing price when you think it's in the middle of Chicago, and it's a great conference to boot. So um, that's my recommendation. Come to Tech Show, take advantage of the academic track, as well as the other great educational content. Dennis, what about you? I mean, my thought is for the schools, really. I mean, the numbers don't lie. I mean, there's something going on, and there is a mismatch between what people are expecting from law schools and what law schools are delivering. I mean, that's obvious. So I, I think that there is a rethink that has to be done. And I looked at things that says, you know, is educating the traditional lawyer in the classic way, does that make sense for all law schools? Or are there other things that relate to delivering legal services in the technology aspects of law and in access to justice, you know, through the internet and other things that we're seeing that law school is a vehicle for, you know, does, is a law school, should it be like a business school or, you know, that says we're doing initiatives, we have centers for innovation, we, you know, there, so there are things happening, we're, we're involved in startups. You know, is that the way a law school is going to differentiate itself from other law schools? You know, and just look at what's out there. What I'd like to leave with Tom is is that we've always been told that law school teaches you how to think like a lawyer. And so my question I want to leave for everybody is in 2017, does thinking like a lawyer include knowing technology in a meaningful way? And the way I ask the question will let you know what I think the answer is, but I think that's something people need to think about. And before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsor. Looking for a process server you can trust? 
ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screened process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mall Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. We usually have an audience question in this segment, and we encourage you to uh, send us your questions. But we had a question for ourselves come up, and we wanted to discuss it in this segment because we thought it made sense for the audience. It actually comes, in a way, from Consumer Reports, which recently recommended against the Microsoft Surface tablets and laptops. Since Tom and I both use and like the Surface products, we thought it might be good to share our reactions to this news. However, we also want to ask you to send us your questions by email, LinkedIn, or our new voicemail number, which Tom will give you in, at the end of the podcast, so you can have your questions covered in this segment in the future. So here we go. Tom, as the TV interviewers like to say, how did this news about the Surface line make you feel? <laughs> well, you know, at first it kind of panicked me because I saw that, uh, I mean, it's a pretty big deal when Consumer Reports withdraws a recommendation for something. And uh, at first it concerned me a great deal because I do like my Surface. I've owned three now. I owned a Surface Pro. Uh, I owned a Surface Book uh, before I ruined it with, unfortunately, somebody's glass of wine spilling on it a couple of months ago, and now I own the Surface laptop, and I like them all. Um, I won't pretend that my experience with them has been perfect, because I think we need to be honest here. Microsoft is new to the world of building hardware. They've done software for a long time, but they've relied on companies like Dell and HP and Asus and all these other um, laptop companies to make the hardware, and so this is new territory for them. A couple things came to mind, though, was the first thing I thought about was a number of years ago, there was a, a time where um, Apple, uh, Consumer Reports actually withdrew a recommendation for the Apple MacBook because of some battery issues. And uh, Apple lobbied, and what do you know, lo and behold, Consumer Reports reinstated that recommendation. Not sure they're going to do it here for Microsoft, but you have to understand that even companies that have great products and that have good, you know, generally great satisfaction still get bad reviews from Consumer Reports. My other somewhat defensive feeling is, is that I really like Consumer Reports for home appliances and big equipment and things like that. I've never been particularly impressed with their technology reviews. Um, so I'm a little critical in that area, but I guess I'll come back and talk. Let's, let's really talk briefly about Microsoft and, and therein, there's no question that because these are new pieces of hardware, they've had issues with returns. I don't think that those numbers are quite as high as Consumer Reports is reporting, but um, there was one generation of the Service Pro and the Service Book, as great a device as it was, they tried to do a lot with um, inserting a tablet into a premium, a high quality laptop and the hardware just didn't work that well together. And so they uh, had lots of returns, but they've improved the product and those returns have dropped off. Now, I, I guess, again, it's me being defensive saying that the Consumer Reports doesn't include the Surface Laptop uh, because that's too new. They don't really have any data on returns for that yet. So we'll have to see how that works out. But I don't think that this has changed. It doesn't. It's not telling me to stop recommending the Surface to people. Um, it's wanting people to be good, diligent shoppers to understand that um, if you're willing to take the chance that you might get a device that has some 1.0 issues. I think it's well worth it. I've had nothing but good experiences with all of my devices. I, you know, I had some software issues, but I think that's a, you know, that's kind of the status quo and and the normal working with Microsoft. But um, I, I don't know. I, I think that um, it's not going to change how I either use uh, Windows devices or recommend them. Uh, what about you, Dennis? I've been thinking about our friend Debbie Foster and how much she loved her Galaxy Note 
seven. And even though they were catching on fire and you were getting these warnings about them every time you were on a plane, she just did not want to give that thing up. And so I, I think that, you know, people have different experiences. And if, if you like something, you're going to, to really like it. So I, I've just had a great experience with my Windows Surface Pro. And I, I think that if you're in the Windows world, it's just to me like a great option. However, like you said, Tom, Consumer Reports, you know, rates things in a number of different ways, and they emphasize things perhaps differently than you or I might, no matter what it is. And so I think it's uh, surfaced, if I can use the word, a potential issue for some people. So if, if the sort of uh, reliability slash problem slash need to get things, uh, need to have additional maintenance is a big factor in your decision, then you, you have to weigh that in, I think. But people make decisions all the time. So like I most recently looking for a car, uh, you know, in consumer reports, I noticed that there are a lot of people who buy cars that have really low ratings in consumer reports. So there are a, a number of different factors. So I've had a good experience, and I always tell people, you know, I, I come back to what I always do on technology. What's the job you're hiring this computer to do? And if you're in a Windows world and you want a combination tablet device, the people I know who use these really like them. And, but you, the trade-off may be that it, Consumer Reports has identified a reliability issue. So you know, that might be a good thing because if it starts to act in a wacky way that you can say, oh, this could be an example of the problems that have uh, the people have found and you can deal with it in a more straightforward way versus in another computer that starts behaving in a wacky way and you're just not sure whether it's you or it's software or it's, it's hardware. So just something to think through and I think it's just you know it's a good time to say let's look at it from you know our own perspective see what makes sense and then like I say I I would factor it into account but you know talk to people who who really like them and then then try to be smart about what matters most most to you well two really quick points um the first one that I as you were talking, I just recalled is that um, Consumer Reports reported a 25% return rate on the Surface tablets, but the return rates for probably five or six other brands that were in the list were really only about four or five percent off. You know, there was one that only had that had a 24% return rate, and a couple that had a 22% return rate, and and you know the 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 bottom six or seven on the list had somewhere between a 19 and 25% return rate. So What's the what's the real difference here? If we have just because it was at the bottom of the list, um, does that really make it truly worse than these others? Because those numbers don't all sound fantastic to me. Um, so that's I, again kind of an interesting thing. The second interesting thing, and Dennis, that you brought it up, is that believe it or not, our good friend Debbie Foster is actually thinking about buying a Surface laptop. I'm not sure that she's going to do it, but uh, she's thinking about doing it at this point in time. So. So that's either validation of what we're thinking or just proof that she likes to live dangerously. Take that as you will, yes. So now it's time for our parting shots, that one tip website, our observation that you can use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. So my parting shot is in part uh, due to our good fr another good friend of ours, Adam Camera, so the Legal Talk Network, who introduced me to his personal assistant, Amy, his artificial intelligent assistant, who was able to schedule meetings with me just by um, asking a few questions in email. I thought it was a, an amazing technology. It did a great job, but they charge money to do that. Uh, uh, over the past week, I've discovered that Microsoft has rolled out its own smart calendaring assistant. I'm not a fan that it calls itself Cortana, but it works very much the same way as Amy.ai, I think is what it was called, or X.ai, I think is what the original tool was called, is you sign up for the service. If you have an Office 365 account, you have to have an Office 365 subscription. You sign up for the service, and then you, um, you CC... Cortana at calendar.help. And when you, in your email, you could say, I'd like to set up a meeting sometime later this week. Let's make it a 30 minute call. My assistant will help make the schedules. And then Cortana will actually back and forth send email to the people that are going to attend the meeting with you. Uh, 
look at your schedule, see what times are available, see what works for them, and schedule a meeting all without your having been involved in it at all. To me, it was I've done it a couple times now. It's a magical experience. It's really cool. So if you are an Office 365 subscriber, go to calendar.help and see if you uh, are eligible to join the program as well. It's free to all Office 365 subscribers. And does Cortana like make suggestions about how you can productively use the time that you would have otherwise wasted on the back and forth trying to set up meetings? That's that would in, be great that's in too. The, that's in the second release. <laughs> yeah. So I have a podcast recommendation, uh, both the podcast itself and a specific ep- episode. So I, you know, I like to sample all sorts of different podcasts. So uh, what I'm liking these days is called the Unmistakable Creative, and uh, the host is Srinivas Rao. And he interviews a whole bunch of interesting people. In a way, it's about creativity and and other things. Um, but on the August 18th, 2017 episode, he interviewed Jerry Colonna, who, you know, is one of these people who, you know, is probably one of the inventors of a lot of things on the Internet, as you'll find out in, in the, the interview. Um, but it's about conversations that we're afraid to have. And Jerry's like super honest and really goes into a lot of things that, you know, about uh, making decisions in what you do, uh, how to deal with success, how to deal with, with failure. Very frank and uh, I was listening to it I just I just found it really helpful to me in, in framing a lot of things that I've been thinking about and and it's probably things that that I and probably most of the listeners we actually are afraid to have conversations about so I would say take a chance on this one listen to to it. There's a little bit of salty language on there, um, but that shouldn't offend you too much uh, because it's very sincere, very passionate, uh, emotional at times. But um, I just think that all of us who are professionals would really benefit from from hearing this and thinking about some of the things that are, are discussed in this podcast. So that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode at tkmreport.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts on the Legal Talk Network site or in your favorite podcasting app. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at tkmreport at gmail.com or visit us at our LinkedIn profiles. Or, as Dennis mentioned, you can call us. We've got our own mailbox, the Dennis and Tom's Tech Questions Hotline. Dial 720-441-6820. That's 720-441-6820. We'd love to feature your question on an upcoming episode of the podcast. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy, and you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus brought to you by the Legal Talk Network. Help us out by rating us in Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.